All right. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul made a distinction between two kinds of people, the natural man and the spiritual man, the person without the spirit and the person with the spirit. One was lost, the other was saved. And, and in chapter 3 that we're going to be in tonight, uh, Paul makes a further distinction between two groups of people. This is a, is, is a distinction among those who have already experienced new life in Christ, but they're not in the same place spiritually. One group is moving on to maturity, growing in their faith, doing the work that, that, that lasts for all eternity, and the other is, is stalled in infancy. Both are believers, but while one is thriving in their walk in the faith, the other is floundering and ineffective. In the beginning of chapter 3, Paul addresses this group of flounderers, which appears to make up, I would assume, the majority of the members of the church in Corinth. And he says this in verses 1 and 2 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready. Now Paul uses the phrase, people of the flesh in verse 1. Your translation may say worldly or use some other uh, word there. As a young believer in the 70s, I thought I knew what a worldly Christian was. I was a person who listened to mainly secular music. They went to the movies. They wore stylish clothes. I thought it was mostly about appearances. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. The word translated here is more accurately the word flesh or being of the flesh. Or as the King James says, carnal. In verse 4, the same word is translated as being unspiritual. In other words, it's the complete opposite of spiritual. It refers to a certain kind of attitude and behavior that, that prevents believers from moving onward and upward in their Christian faith. Paul tells the Corinthians that since they're still like infants in their faith, he had to give them the spiritual equivalent of milk because they weren't ready for solid food. And that echoes to some extent what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14. It says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature. The writer of Hebrews is talking to the same kinds of believers that Paul was talking to, which tells us that, that, that this condition of stunted growth really wasn't that rare, I don't think. Therefore, I think Christians today need to resist the tendency and the temptation to start floundering. Paul speaks pretty bluntly to the church in Corinth, telling them, you're not where you ought to be, and you're not nearly as far along as mature as you think you are. And it's your own fault. You're doing this to yourself, he tells them. He, he, he tells them that they're sabotaging their own spiritual growth. 
How are they doing this? Well, look in verses 3 and 4 here in chapter 3. It says, For us, since there is envy and strife among you, you are not fleshly and living like unbelievers. No, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? For whenever someone says, I'm with Paul, and another, I'm with Apollos, you are not unspiritual people. Are you not unspiritual people? I don't know why I'm having trouble reading tonight. As, as we saw in weeks prior to this, there were a number of different divisions in the Corinth church. Each group identified with or associated to a different Christian leader. Paul and Apollos and Cephas and even Christ. And each group tended to look down on the other groups. And it was creating all kinds of conflict within the church. And so Paul is saying, you can't move to the next level of spiritual growth until you leave this pettiness, this petulance behind and you begin to act like, for lack of a better word, grown-ups. Being a teacher, it can be difficult to preach a sermon on this passage to a church like ours. Because we don't experience the same kind of disunity and division that was common in Corinth. And honestly, I can tell you that I'm very thankful for that. Okay? That makes me happy. Okay? But still, I can't read a passage such as this without thinking, how do these verses apply to me? Individually. Are there areas in my life in which I'm being petty and grumpy, for lack of a better word? Am I doing the things or saying the things that, that can cause division? Am I holding myself back from the growth that God intends for me? Every Christian needs to ask those same questions. Every church needs to ask those questions. And, 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 and there are areas in which we're all small-minded. There are areas in which we're holding ourselves or others back. Today, as we look at the sinful attitudes that stood in the way of unity and growth among the church in Corinth, I want us to try to consider three things that we can do to make sure that we're not behaving as Paul would say, as unspiritual people. These ideas are going to apply to your personal life, to your work life, if you're still working, your family life, your social life, and of course your church life. Here are three things that we need to do to avoid this trap of holding ourselves back. First of all, let's make an effort to move away from petty conflicts. The theological differences between Paul and Apollos and Cephas probably didn't amount to a whole lot. Maybe a difference in their approach or style or, or, or what they emphasized. Maybe even some minor differences in ideology. We can assume since, since none of these men were, were perfect, were infallible, that there were some differences there. However, they were, for the most part, on the same page theologically. And yet their followers used these minor differences between them to create major quarrels amongst themselves to the point that they were unable to function as a loving Christian fellowship. We need to be sure that we're not guilty of doing the same thing. Part of being a spiritual grown-up is being able to accept the idea that someone at some time might have an opinion that's different from my own. And that's okay. I don't have to think that I'm right about everything all the time. Now I am. But I don't have to think that. 
I saw a cartoon that kind of sums this up. There's a man who's sitting in front of his computer and his wife calls out, are you coming to bed? And he answers, I can't, this is important. And she says, what is? And he responds, someone is wrong on the internet. Being of one mind doesn't mean that everyone has the same opinion about everything all the time. It means that everyone has the same commitment to seeking the truth and learning the truth while supporting one another in love. This is why John Wesley said, may we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion, Without a doubt, we may. In the book of Romans, Paul said in Romans 12, 18, if possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. It's a great attitude to have. By saying, I'm not going to be the reason that there is conflict among us. I'm not going to be the reason that there is disunity in our body. If we're going to put an end to spiritual self-sabotage, let's move away from petty conflicts. And here's the second thing. And it may sound as if I'm shifting gears here, but I'm really not on this topic. Number two, let's place no limit on the lessons we can learn from others. Again, back in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4, it says, For whenever someone says, I'm with Paul, and another, I'm with Apollos, are you not unspiritual people? There were those in the Corinthian church who would say, I am of Paul. And they hung on his every word. And then there were those who said, I follow Apollos. And they hung on his every word. And there were those who said, I'm with Cephas. And they hung on his every word. Again, theologically, there probably wasn't a nickel's worth of difference between these two leaders. But that didn't stop each group of followers from manufacturing a difference. When someone from Paul's group was teaching Do you think those in the other groups had any respect for what he said? I don't think so. Do you think they were willing to listen and and ready to learn when someone from the other side got up to speak? Probably not. I've never been in a church where there's been division among the membership over various speakers. But I have been in churches where there has been division over various styles of music. And I've heard people on both sides of the debate say, I just can't worship with that kind of music. My response should have been, I'll be right back. Let me run to the microwave and get your milk. However, I didn't. And I say that in jest a little bit. However, I did serve in a church where the older people wanted nothing but the old hymns. They didn't like any of the modern worship songs at all unless it was written by the Gaithers. That was their one caveat. The youth in the church loved the worship songs, but they hated the old hymns. Both said that they couldn't worship through the other's music style. Being the music minister at this church, it left me, and the the youth minister, it left me trying to bring both groups together. Even going so far 
as to telling the older members of the church that they were supposed to be the spiritually mature ones and that they needed to be the ones to teach the youth about acceptance. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> but I've also had to learn this lesson myself. You all know, I assume, I've said it enough times, that I am not necessarily the biggest fan of Southern gospel music. I'm just not. However, most churches that I've been a part of had a large percentage of people who enjoyed it. And so I would schedule in Southern gospel groups to sing. When I first came to Southeast Texas, I was in Woodville. I was at a church in Woodville. And I was contacted about having the Southern Plainsmen come in for a concert. I scheduled them in. It was their last performance, their last show, if you will, before Christmas. And so when I talked to him on the phone, because I'd not ever met him before, and I said, can you do some Christmas stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. I said, great, come on. So we scheduled it in. After they got done, they were going to go home for a Christmas break, if you will. They weren't going to go back out on the road until sometime the end of January. After the concert, we fed them. That's all they require. That's still all they require. When they come to a church, they'd like to have a place to set up their table and they just want to be fed. Give them some food after the concert. So that we did that. And then I sat around with them and there were, there were a few folks who had come to the concert that they knew. And we sat down after we got done eating, we moved back into the sanctuary and just sat around in the sanctuary talking and talking and talking. We sat there until three in the morning chatting. It was at that point, through that talking, that I got to know Marcel Slaughter. He's the really high tenor. He's the one who, who keeps the Southern Plainsmen going at this point. I got to know Marcel, and I got to appreciate his spirit. I learned something that I, that I had head knowledge of, but I didn't have a heart knowledge of. But we were all on the same team. We were all doing what we were called to do. Trying to serve God through music, through the ministries that we were a part of. I consider Marcel a friend in the ministry. And I love to have Marcel in. Uh, ever since I was there, I've, I try to have Marcel in at least once a year at every church that I've been in since I first met him in Woodville and we sat around talking for six hours. And God had to work on me and show me how much I had been closing myself off to anybody who did Southern Gospel music. 
we need to get past the idea that those with a different perspective have nothing to offer us in the way of leadership. And we need to get past the idea that those who aren't a part of our clique are somehow the enemy. Have you ever noticed that after a football game, there are times when the players themselves talk and hug, and sometimes they gather at the 50-yard line to pray. They see themselves as colleagues and co-laborers, if you will. If there's a fight, it's usually among the fans. The very people who made no actual contribution to the outcome of the game. The players themselves, many times, are friends. The fans, sometimes, act like enemies. This attitude of us and them doesn't come from an emotionally superior or, or spiritually superior place. It comes from a place of immaturity and infancy. And this attitude has no place among those who desire to grow into the fullness of their faith. If we want to put an end to spiritual self-sabotage, then let's not exclude others unnecessarily. Let's be willing to at least listen. And let's be willing to learn. And that brings us to the third idea that I want you to consider. Let's remember our place in the process. Verses 5 through 7 here in 1 Corinthians 3 says, What then is Apollos and what is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. In these verses, Paul talks about his work and the work of Apollos. And he says that, that one planted the seed and the other watered it. They each did their part, and it was God who caused the growth. At times, Paul has said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But he didn't ever consider himself to be anyone's guru. I don't believe Cephas or Apollos did either. They each had their work to do in the kingdom. They each had their role to play, and they each trusted God to bring everything together in the end. The results were for his glory, not theirs. And then Paul closes out in verse 9. He says, For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. Look <laughs> what it says. You are God's field. In other words, you are God's project. In week one of this series, I talked about how you're a work. We're each a work in progress. And I quoted Paul's words to the church in Philippi. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Your spiritual growth isn't dependent upon Paul or Apollos or, or, or this preacher or that preacher your level of worship isn't determined by any style or any song or any singer. God is the one who causes us to grow. When we take our eyes off of him and look, look towards anything else, a preacher, a teacher, a politician, a pundit, a singer, an author, a denomination, and on and on, when we give any human person or any human endeavor God's rightful place in our lives, we sabotage our spiritual growth. And we remain stalled in infancy. Let's remember that our role in this process 
is to yield ourselves to God. We are to be his field, his project, so that he can nurture in us a nature that is more like his son, Jesus Christ. That means that he will send Paul your way and Apollos and Cephas and James and John, maybe Timothy, and we should welcome each one of them because he uses all of them to do his work in our lives. His work, not theirs. His work in our lives for his glory and for our good. Paul aims this passage of scripture at those who are still being fed milk because they're not yet ready for solid food. And they're not yet ready because they don't want to be ready. They would rather bicker among themselves than experience the fullness of God's blessings in their life and in their church. They would rather be, be part of their own little cult and personality than participate in the power that God provides. And Paul said to them, you are babies in Christ today, and it's your own choice. The message to us then is pretty clear. Every time we practice pettiness, every time we create a major conflict over a minor matter, we sabotage our opportunity for spiritual growth. Every time we put on airs of elitism, every time we act condescendingly towards those who aren't a part of our little inner circle, we sabotage our opportunity for spiritual growth. Any time we build a spiritual foundation on anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ, we sabotage our opportunity for spiritual growth. Today, what I'm saying is, let's do away with all of this self-sabotage. And instead, let's fully embrace God's work in our lives. Each of us can say, I am God's project. I am his work in progress. And I welcome every individual that he sends my way knowing that they're there to help me be more like him. Take out your prayer sheets, if you would.